Good evening, everyone. Hope everyone's doing okay. Having a good day closing in on that bank holiday. Hope we've got some good plans. I'm going to get Rena Wadu on. We're going to chat about some perio. And we're going to finish up all the sort of main fields, right? This is quite exciting. Get the uh, restorative uh, sort of set all completed up. We get some bingo done. So just wait for uh, Rena to come and join us. I think she's going to join us on the um, on the RW Perio account. And uh, we can get cracking. We had quite a few questions coming in. Um, we're going to cover sort of uh, sort of guidance for the GDP and then some bits on recession, crown lengthening, some more of the cosmetic bits. Um, so I think that would be, be really good. I know she's very, very busy, so hopefully we've uh, caught her and we'll get her on in good time. How's everyone doing? Hey, Adrian. How are we doing? Come in, Nancy. Here we go, straight in. Hi. How are we doing? Good, how are you? I'm good. You had a busy day. I saw you on the radio. Yes, we were on BBC London today, so that was fun. <laughs> Spreading Re the very message to the world. <laughs> recording yeah. today or? Uh, pardon? Actually recording it today. Or... Yeah, it was live. It was just oh, amazing. Um, like question and answers and they were talking about perio and menopause and pregnancy and things like that. So um, yeah, it was really interesting. How's your day? Day off, non-clinical day. So. Very nice. Admin day. <laughs> admin day, life admin day. Had a couple of little bits to try and sort out, but yeah, uh, yeah not even too bad. Were you in clinic for the rest of the day? Or? I was indeed, yeah. yeah. So it's been a busy one, which is good. Uh, as well. Thanks for coming on a, on a, on a busy evening. I know yeah, I saw you doing loads of other stuff with uh, some students as well earlier in the week. So yes, <laughs> big week for you. You need that bank holiday weekend break. Absolutely. No, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much. Now, ah, awesome. I mean, in terms of anyone who doesn't know who you are, which would be crazy, but just give a quick little intro <laughs> if you can about yourself and, and what we're going to chat about. Yeah, sure. So, um, so I'm Rena, um, so I'm a specialist periodontist, um, based in, largely based in 75 Harley Street, which is our specialist clinic. Um, so that's my kind of home. Um, pretty much in terms of my week, I would probably spend about three, four days with patients. Um, and then like you, I have an admin day, we do a lot of <laughs> stuff and press, things like that. Um, I do a bit of teaching. So we've launched Perio School last year during the lockdown, which is super exciting. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of uh, dedicated, uh, more probably than a day a week, but dedicate at least a day a week to teaching. Um, so yeah, a nice mix of things, essentially. And the, the diploma as well, right? Is that that separate to Perio yeah. School or running no, through so, so the Perio School is an online and offline platform where we offer online courses for people all over the world. And then largely in the UK, we'll have the in-person courses. And one of those, the latest sort of in-person course is the diploma that we're launching um, in January, which is almost full, which is really exciting. So I literally Amazing. Um, we're making uh, new training facilities at, at the 75 Harley Street. So we're getting that all sorted out in the next couple of months. So it's all, all go, go, go. <laughs> oh, fantastic. Having it all in-house. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, uh, and who's that aimed for? Is that aimed at, at GDPs um, wanting to do a bit of sort of special interest or? Uh, it's actually, um, so there's a group for, for dentists. There's a specific diploma for dentists where we do a lot of surgical stuff live patient um uh, surgery all that kind of stuff that's for um dentists not necessarily who just want a special interest actually what you'll find is perio brings everything together so when you understand that it's actually for for dentists who just want to do really good restorative work and really good bring you know really good smile aesthetic cases so um and then we've got another one for hygienists if they want to take it to another level we've got a tailored one for them as well so um yeah Maybe. No, I, th I think that's a really good approach. I mean, we were chatting before about when we were planning yeah. this, and I think it's probably the bit where I'm most sort of rusty with all the, the sure. basic, not necessarily the knowledge of perio, but more like what's possible yes. in, in someone like your hands. I mean, I work with a periodontist, but it's very much sort of like, I go, well, you can probably help me go and see him, rather than actually being like, oh, like surgery would be great here, or crown length, you know, things like that. So I think yeah. we're obviously going to get into that, but... Sure. Um, uh, so yeah, I mean, well, that is the first sort of thing, really, is sort of general perio management for the GDP. Yeah. Lots of people asked about splinting. I didn't know that was such a, yeah. a hot topic. Everyone wanted to know, but yeah, you know, have, have things changed in the last? When was it? Was it 2017? The all the yeah, big changes. Um, so the new classification, um, which is really, I mean, I call it. I should stop calling it new classification. It's like quite a few years old, as you said. It's, it's, the, it's the classification. The, the classification. <laughs> yes, the updated classification um, was launched a few years ago, and I think it's really important for us to all start using it because it's been a few years now, um, and it's an expectation to obviously diagnose, 
diagnose using the current classification, diagnose accurately. So I think, unfortunately, perio is one of the biggest reasons why people get sued. I mean, three quarters of claims are mm. perio related. And unfortunately, one of them is two, two main reasons. One is failure to diagnose and the other one is failure to refer. And the mm -hmm. diagnosis part is so important. And when you look at these medical legal cases, there's so many people who haven't put in their notes what the diagnosis is. And sometimes you think, oh, I've, I'm pretty sure I told the patient they had peri. I'm pretty sure I wrote it. You look back at your notes and you're like, actually, where is it? I've left it out. It must have been a busy day. But that's mm -hmm. when the patient will, you know, basically sue you and I'll get them to pay for their implants, which is not great. Um, so I think we really need to be, I mean, the first thing is, is you kind of, nailed it is, is is diagnosis we've got to get diagnosis right and we've got to be using the new classification but it's not too bad i mean the way i teach it is i break it down into six steps i don't know if you want me to go through that but go for it far away probably useful so um the first step i always do so this is for diagnosing periodontitis um first step is is this patient a periodontitis patient so you look at your radiographs and if you see there's bone loss that's due to perio right don't forget bone loss can happen to you to other reasons like crown thinning causes bone loss, um, extraction of AIDS <laughs> causes bone loss. Um, so as long as it's due to perio, your patient is classed as a periodontitis patient. So that's step one, regardless of whether they have pockets or not. Um, the second step is you look at your bone levels and you ask yourself, is the bone loss generalized or localized? Or is it molar incisor? So is, are the only the mo first molars and the incisors affected? And that will give you your sort of disease extent just from your radiographs. Then you have a look at the, um, the staging of it. So you pick the worst tooth in the mouth. So for example, if you had a patient who had an upright five with like 90% bone loss due to perio and the rest of the mouth had 10%, you've got to go with that worst case scenario. And then you divide the root up into thirds and you see where the bone loss lies. So if it's in the coronal third, it's stage two. Stage, stage one is like hardly anything. So stage two is coronal third, stage three is mid third and apical third is stage four. Um, and that will give you your stage. So that's step three. And then you ask yourself, okay, how susceptible is my patient? I figured out how severe it is. Now, how susceptible are they? So that's when grading comes into play. Mm -hmm. And with grading, you can either be, so staging was one, two, three, and four. Grading is A, B, and C. So grading, if their bone loss is more than their age, they are clearly susceptible. Like if you've got a 50 year old with 80% bone loss, clearly that's their susceptible patient. It's rapid loss of bone. So they're gonna be grade C. For someone whose bone loss is less than half their age, so they're not that susceptible, like a 50 year old with you know, 5% bone loss, they're not that susceptible, they're grade A. And then anything in between is grade B. So that's step four. So step one was, is it a periodontitis patient? Do they have bone loss due to perio? Um, if they do, they are a periodontitis patient. Step two is the bone loss generalized or localized, easy. Step mm -hmm. three, pick the worst tooth, divide the root up into thirds. Is it coronal, mid or apical third? And then step four, just ask yourself, is the, the bone loss more than their age, less than half their age or anything in between? And that will give you your grade. So your first four steps are pretty much from radiographs. And that's why I always say to everyone, you need the right radiographs. Um, and you, you need radiographs, full stop. Because um, if you don't, then you're, you're gonna miss um, you don't want to be able to diagnose properly. So that's a, that's a key learning point. OPGs or PAs? Um, well, the thing <laughs> is, I'm a very like, lenient periodontist. So personally, I would say, if you can see the bone, you're fine. That's, a, all the, that's a question I'd always ask yourself. Can you see the bone in all mm -hmm. areas? Yeah. And the thing is, if they are a severe perio patient, you're going to need a PA. I have no problems with DPTs either. It just depends on the quality of them. And I would just be a little careful anteriorly. And I, if I had a DPT, Posteriorly, I'd be fine, but I'd probably take some supplemental anterior PAs. Yeah. Um, so that's step four. And then step five, now we actually need to figure out what are we treating because we don't treat bone loss, right? So you're thinking, probably, probably thinking, gosh, why did I waste four of the six steps just looking at bone loss? The reason why is because you need to know the susceptibility and severity of your perio patient, regardless of whether they're active or not. Because once your patient is a perio patient, unfortunately, they are a perio patient for life. So that level of diagnosis is important to understand your patient. But mm -hmm. then you need to look at the pockets and the bleeding because that's what you treat. So that's when your fifth step come in, comes in, which is your current disease status. And this is when you look at your BPs, you look at your pocket charts and you ask yourself, OK, what am I treating here? And your patient's either going to be currently active or unstable, basically, um, or they're going to be in remission where they've got a bit of bleeding, but no deep pockets, 
or they're going to be completely um, completely stable or healthy, mm -hmm. essentially. So that's step five. And then the final thing is just to add on any risk factors. So if they're a smoker or if they're, uh, they've got diabetes, you need to add that on in terms of, you know, actually in your diet, what we call a diagnostic statement. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't mean the other risk factors aren't important, like stress and everything else. They're still important. Um, but the ones that you actually tag onto your diagnostic statement um, are smoking and um, diabetes. Thanks, Jazz. You're, you're making me blush. I know. I'm going to need <laughs> um, to get ring lighting, clearly. I need to get um, ring lights sorted. <laughs> um, so, um, so, yeah, that's your final. The reason why they picked diabetes and smoking is because they're the ones that you can measure and control. Mm -hmm. So that's why yeah. they've picked those. And they're the, probably one of the most imp the important risk factors at play here. So um, that's how I, sorry, it's a quite a long answer. No, how I really break up the, the six steps um, in the new classification. And personally, what I would do is update your templates and your notes so that it's mm -hmm. literally very easy for you to edit it and come up with your final diagnostic statement. And I promise We've you- We've got it as a clean screen, one of those okay, things yeah, that pop perfect. up. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that's a great way of doing it. You just got to make it easy for yourself, um, mm. but definitely do it. And um, you probably agree, once you've got it, it actually doesn't take that long. It probably takes, you know, about a minute or two if you, you follow those steps. So um, yeah, that's, that's what I would recommend in terms of new classification, definitely use it. Because the thing is, that's then going to guide how you treat the patient, because um, I'm sure you're aware that now the new kid on the block is a new treatment guidelines. So yeah. that, that's, you know, the new stuff that we need to be aware of. Yeah, so I mean, the, that, that was going to be the. You, you're doing my job for me. This is great. I'm just going. I'm just going to go, and you can just uh, go for it. And um, yeah, so that's the thing. It used to be, you know, you look at and you go, right, BP three. You're going to do yeah. general treatments, da, 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 get them back in three months, six point. What What's it now then? How's that? Is it still that kind of principle of you do a localized yeah. quadrant, six point? Yeah, to be fair, the, the way we treat perio, it remains the same. Um, and the BPs are still useful to guide your treatment. Um, what's new is the, the guidelines in terms of that. It's just a bit more structured. Also, like terminology has changed. So I guess the first thing to highlight is we no longer call it scaling or debridement or anything like that. The new word... Professional is, mechanical... Well, yeah, exactly. Like, You've yeah. Got it. Professional mechanical plant removal. Yeah. Um, I've got a slight problem with it because we... I mean... Plaque is not not really the kind of that's the old fashioned world. So I'm not sure why they went for PMPR. Um, it's bi all about biofilm. But anyway, um, uh, that's what it's called PMPR. So you're either doing super gingival PMPR or sub gingival PMPR. So that literally encompasses everything else that we used mm -hmm. to do. Um, so that's going to take some time to get used to. But that's a new phrase. And the way we treat it, they've divided up these new guidelines that were just released, I think just a couple of months ago, to be honest. So um, if you're not aware of them, if you have a look at the BSP website, have a look at the Journal of Dentistry, it's free to download. There's like 64 recommendations. It's um, what we call S3 level. So it's evidence-based and it's mm -hmm. also consensus-based, um, which means they basically looked at all the papers, but also they've got together a group of professionals, they've uh, taken into account opinions. They've also taken into account, interestingly, the BSP have taken into account patients' opinions, which I think are really important nowadays. So anyway, they then release these 64 recommendations. And to summarize, there are four steps in your treatment of periodontitis stage one to three. And it always starts off with supra, PMPR, and risk factor control. Mm -hmm. And now the thinking with perio, it's not just about bacteria. It's about looking at a patient holistically. So are they a smoker? Okay, what can I do to deal with that? Do they have diabetes? Can I discuss the importance of diabetes control? It's a lot more than just, oh, you're not brushing your teeth because, you know, that's a very small part of it. So mm -hmm. that's your first step. Once you've got your patient engaged and they've actually defined engaged, so um, anyone with a plant score of less than 20% or equal to that, or anyone who improves their plant score by 50% has been you know, defined as an engaged patient, which is actually I think, really quite nice because in the past, I mean, if you had a patient who had 100% plaque, and then they're trying really hard and they get to 50. It's a bit mean to say, oh, sorry, not good you're, not, you're not brushing your teeth. So you're not allowed to have treatment. And actually they're trying really, really hard. So mm -hmm. I think we're, there's a bit more leniency there, which is nice. Um, so if they're engaged, you then move them on to step two, which is subgingival PMPR. And as you said, I mean, there's no, there's no real change in the way we treat it. So you can do it quadrant by quadrant. You can do half mouth, you can use hand scalers, ultrasonics, whatever you want to do. Um, 
there's a bit of update on like use of adjunctive things like um, in terms of adjunctive antiseptics, antibiotics, things like that. There's a bit of update on that. Um, but then you reevaluate. And if they're still, they've still got deep pockets, which many of them will, you either redo your subgingival PMPR or you might then refer at this point. Um, mm -hmm. And that's when that's step three. And often when you refer, the periodontist, you know, or the complexity to you dentist will do some surgery. Not everyone will have surgery, but only a few, but um, that might be the case for step three. And then the final step is maintenance. So mm -hmm. anyone who's had perio, regardless of the severity, needs supportive periodontal care. Without that, everything will fall apart. So it's really important we actually discuss that with our patients from the beginning, that you will need lifelong care. Yeah, well, you, you said that at the start, it's, it's a lifelong diagnosis. They're going, to be, they're going to be stable, but they're still going to need maintenance. Yeah, absolutely. It's a bit like, I mean, the way I explain it to patients is, um, I love analogies. So I, I will say to them, you know, it's a bit like having a car. You have to get it serviced every so often, otherwise it will fall apart and then it's even more expensive to repair. So, you know, you've yeah. got to, you, you're not unhealthy, but you've got to keep it stable. You've got to keep it on, keep on top of it. So, um, and you, they need to, they need to know that whether you're treating them on privately or on the NHS, if they don't know that every three months they're coming back, they might not want to invest in, in getting their mouth sorted. So, mm -hmm. um, it's an important conversation. I think the, the interesting thing you said, sort of stage one, then modifying the risk factors, because you did, uh, Petru uh, sorry, uh, leaders, didn't you? Oh, you've done both. You did both. But you did yeah. leaders and you were talking and you were talking through it about the risk factors. And I was listening to it and I thought, oh, and somewhere like you've got on high you're like, you should be get, you know, getting in a dietitian, a diabetes. And then the next thing you said, I'm looking at getting that in. So is that something that you're looking oh. to do multi, you know, holistic? And, oh, yeah. yeah. I think the way forward is multidisciplinary care. Um, and, you know, I was having this conversation with um, one of my colleagues the other day, like, I actually think there's a need for a nutritionist, a need for, mm -hmm. we, we work with some diabetes specialists as well, endocrinologists who are around in the area, we do refer to them as well. And th that's the way forward. I really think it's really backwards to think, oh, the mouth is in isolation to the body. I don't know why it's been like that for years. But I think it really is time to put the mouth back into the body and actually treat your patient as a whole. And honestly, like our hygienists are amazing. They'll always talk about diet. They'll always talk about stress. And those little tweaks, those conversations, I'm not saying to like spend you know, an hour doing like counseling to your patient, but those little tweaks, like, did you know, Mr. Smith, stress is related to perio? Did you know that, you know, diet is important you need to have a good amount of nutrition they'll really get into it and sometimes unfortunately they do care more about the other stuff so if you can get them into a healthy diet get them into other things you, you know you'll change everything together so it's a common it's common risk factors isn't it so um a hundred percent think it's the way forward yeah I think, and it, it, yeah it, make, it makes complete sense because you'll do it with you know smoking cessation obviously it's more difficult in a general practice setting where you're going to be like right, go to your GP to talk about this. And you do, you mention those things, you know, yeah. you say your diabetes has got to be really well controlled, make sure you're checking it. But it sort of stops there, doesn't it? You say yeah, it. Yeah, but don't, I mean, don't, um, honestly, like the studies show that even like less than a minute's worth of smoking cessation will improve success rates. So you've got to, it's just, you know, get that phrase. So I personally would say something like, um, you know, it's, it's really important, not just for your, your oral health, but your general health to try and stop smoking. Uh, I used to say reduce, but I think as a healthcare professional, we should be saying stop, not reduce. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's really important to stop smoking. And then I would introduce a stat like, did you know that if you use the NHS uh, stop smoking services, that will triple your chance of stopping. And a stat like that would be like, oh, okay, maybe I might actually take that on then. Mm -hmm. um, so it's just about saying the right things, but don't underestimate the power of just a few, you know, sense. And the studies actually show that patients expect us to talk about it. Um, they see us as a healthcare professionals, so they expect us to have that conversation. Yeah. Uh, we just had, a question just popped here yeah. from uh, Adisa Garcia saying, regarding adjunctives, what are you frequently using? What situations? Yeah, really good um, question. So with um, certain patients, like, well, anyway, certain patients, like people who struggle with manual dexterity, they've got really inflamed gums, so much so that they they literally can't even start using products or, or hygiene practices. So those I sometimes adjunct uh, with a mouthwash just for two weeks. Um, and I'll use the C word. I hate the C word. <gasps> but, uh, cordicil. Yeah, cordicil. Yes, cordicil. cordicil. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, there's very, very specific um, uh, cases that, that we use that. Um, 
Uh, and um, apart from that, um, sometimes antibiotics are useful as well. Antibiotics are useful for your like stage four um, grade C patients, um, your rapid loss of attachment susceptible patients. To be honest, in general practice, those patients I would refer across. Um, mm -hmm. So it's, it's limited. You've got to have a basically You've got to justify it. You've got to have a reason for it. And with these sort of things like the antibiotics, there, like, are you doing that in your first line treatment or are you doing sort of that, as you said, that initial treatment and risk factors and then is it coming in the adjuncts later down it, the line? It will come when you do your step two, so your subgingival PMPR. Fine. And you're, you're sort of, again, you're sort of ascertaining uh, sort of the commitment to it and, and things 100%. like that as well. Um, and yeah. also if you're doing like half mouth or quadrant by quadrant, it will be the once you've done the whole mouse, if I was doing half and half, I'd give the antibiotics on the second visit. That's really important. Otherwise, the antibiotics don't get to where they need to be if you're not debriding it properly. Perfect. And slight little, slight little revert back. You're talking about stress and things there. Yeah. Have you noticed changes over COVID? Oh, my God. Yeah, of course. Like, mm. um, because we're a periclinic, we also keep, sometimes we keep patients off for maintenance with a hygienist, see them three monthly. So many of our patients, like really normally very, very Regression. And... Yeah, there's been so much relapse. And it's not because they haven't done their home care, but it's just literally stress affects your whole body. And for these susceptible patients, I say to them, your gums are your weak spot. So any changes in the body, it's, it's going to relapse. So it's unfortunately, um, and then it's a combination of things as well. So some of them are stressed. Then they're grinding their teeth, so there's secondary occlusal trauma. Then they're not eating properly. Then, you know, some of them aren't doing their oral hygiene because they're stressed about this and that. And, you know, the, the routine is completely out. So um, it's not good news for perio. It's, there's been a real increase, definitely, from mm. what I've seen. Yeah, it's a really good way of putting it. Your gums are where you're going to show, carry, yeah. you'll carry your stress almost. Yeah, um, I mean, yeah. when people get stressed, right, they get like rashes and they get, they get all these, why, you know, it's the same thing in the gums. It will come out in your gums. It's exactly mm -hmm. the same. I like that. Uh, get Smilers just asked, do you have any recommendations for special care patients? Um, yeah, I mean, it's, I would say for special care patients, you have to see where they're struggling and that they're the ones actually that adjuncts might be really useful and they're the ones mm -hmm. where you really need to give them that tailored advice for their situation. And in the new guidelines, actually, there is a focus on, um, there is a focus on tailored or personalized medicine. So personalized approach. So, okay, what are they struggling with? What can I do? And that's the whole thing about the new guidelines is that you've got to tailor it to your individual and you have to keep reassessing and see what's working. I thought for a second, you're going to be taking cultures out of pockets and, testing antibiotics yeah, and things like not quite <laughs> not quite not there yet not there yet um oh, load the questions are flying in now um sometimes it's difficult to convince patients with severe period to see a specialist what would you suggest yeah uh, trying to convince them? well i guess you don't really have this problem because you are the specialist so they're well, coming to see you but... no, all of my referrers ask me this question um mm -hmm. and yeah. i have to say most of just because we're in high street doesn't mean you know we just get patients from the air most of my patients are from normal nhs practice of tons of low-income patients it's about how it's all about communication in in perio and dentistry i guess in general it's the way you explain things to people. So what I would say, firstly, normally the barrier is finance, right? So normally what I would say, firstly, you need to give them the real story. Like not, oh, you might want to see a specialist, you might not. You just have to say, your gum disease is severe. You are at risk of losing your teeth. This could impact on your general health. I really need to send you somewhere that can help you. And then you explain, obviously, what they'll do that is it's different. They treat patients with really severe gum disease and that you know they get really good results if we what i can do there's a limit to it and there's a limit on the guidelines and in terms of what we can do here for you then they'll ask about cost and the way to explain finance is an interesting thing you say to them basically um what's the cost of not treating it right so for example if you lose a tooth right one tooth do you know how much an implant is mr smith they'll be like oh i don't know a couple hundred no it's three thousand pounds for one implant my treatment plan for a severe perio generalized case will never go over about 2000. That's with the whole mouth, not one tooth, right? So what's a cost per tooth? Cost per mm -hmm. tooth is like, you know, 60 pound a tooth or something. And also most clinics will offer interest free finance where they can split the payment over 10 months, works out about 100 or 200 pounds a month. It's like a really good gym membership for your mouth. So yeah. <laughs> when you explain it to patients and they think, and then that I just say to them, look, go for a consultation and then see you know, what the specialist has to say most of them will come for the consultation and then you leave it up to the clinic to, to try and explain exactly what's going on so you'll be surprised it's all about communicating and if you say the right things most people 
you know, when you really want something, you will you will try and save up for it or make it happen. And I think mm -hmm. most people do. So I think it's it's all about the conversation. Um, so Amar was asking there. You said obviously not everyone's coming straight off the. Yeah, you know, they're not coming straight from Malibu or whatever. But since no. you're on Harley Street, or are you? Do you have a high high severity of perio in sort of these high stress jobs, central London people, bankers, investors, etc. Um, they're definitely a category. Um, I wouldn't say they're the only ones, but definitely, I mean, even things like the rare things like necrotizing starts to affect these type of people because they're high stress, not sleeping properly, you know, smoking, um, and their immune system's down. So yeah, they are a typical category, but sometimes it's surprising who gets perio. You can't always predict it. And it's a lot of it's 50% uh, is down to the, to their genetic makeup. So, um, but yeah, we, we do see a lot of, lot of those types of patients as well. Some of them also, the other thing I'm seeing with that category is some of them are over brushing. So I've had mm -hmm. quite a few of them coming out. My gums have received. Type A. Exactly. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, we've got this, this is a, this is going to be a sort of a big question now though. In your view, a Cavatron better than piezoelectric? Is that going to turn into a big, big scrap? No, I mean, it's, I, I, I have to say, um, I used to be a Cavatron girl. I was convinced on that. Then <laughs> I, I've, got, I've got both in my practice. I literally have both there if I want to use either. Um, and then I try the piezo. The, the reason why I like the piezo is because it's got the, so I got the one with the airflow system as well. And then the water warms up and it's all very, if you use it well, it's more technique sensitive because you can only use the lateral surfaces. If you use it well, it works, you know, beautifully. But I have to say, I mean, if you wanted my recommendation, I would say either is fine, really. Mm -hmm. It's the way you use it. Um, and, you know, more often than not, it's the quality of your instruments. So if you're using blunt tips, um, if, if, you know, if it's worn down by like two millimeters, your tip, it reduces your efficiency by 50%. So personally, I wouldn't worry about the system. I'd worry about the quality of your tips, making sure you're regularly changing them, checking the wear. You can get wear guides so you can objectively see when you need to replace them. Um, that's more important than anything else. Oh, there we go. Um, well, the, the questions have stopped, so we'll, we'll quickly move on. Um, but Aish has asked, will it be saved? Yeah, it's all, they're all these lives that we do. They're all saved on, on, uh, on my Instagram TV, so you can catch that later. Um, oh, another one's popped in. Cool. Smiles by Jody said, I'm currently a student hired and finding it hard for patients to take ownership by not believing smokers have anything to do with it. Uh, any advice on how to address that? So I guess you know, it's just patients that don't want to hear it. Yeah. How do you, how do you approach that? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's how you say it. Um, and I, I always start off actually um, with, you know, a large reason why you've got the gum disease is genetics. So it's partly not your fault because then they're more open to listening to what you have. Because you're, so you're like, not coming at them. Exactly. Because, you know, it's, it's not fully their fault. And if you say, oh, it's because you're not brushing your teeth and you're smoking this and that, they will just switch off. So you've got to get them receptive first. So, you know, just mm -hmm. say, because every single patient has a genetic susceptibility to them, some of them more than others, but every single patient is, you know, it's to do with how the host responds to the bacteria. So you can start off with that. Then you can say there are other things that do make it worse, like smoking. It doesn't cause it, it just makes it happen quicker. And like, uh, you know, this and that. And then you can bring it into the conversation. Um, and you've always got to give them a bit of good news, like something like, you know, um, the good news is treatable. And one of the things we can do and try and work together is to try and reduce or cut, the, you know, stop the smoking and, and bring it in with other things. I wouldn't just literally focus on one thing. As a, otherwise, they'll just, just switch off, basically. Perfect. Um, so the main question that we had, I think two or three times, um, was about splinting. Um, so is perio splinting something that you're doing regularly? Is it something you're doing less of, more of? Yeah, splinting's an interesting one. Um, and the really, there's not that many indications for splinting teeth. Um, the only indication is, or only two indications is, if you've treated the perio and the mobility is continually increasing and it's causing mm. discomfort, um, in that case, I would then splint. There's not many other reasons why. Um, and actually, what you'll find if you start just splinting teeth again, you think they're going to hold off um, better. They're probably not because what happens is if you've got perio patient, they have differential mobility. So one tooth is like grade two, one tooth is like grade three, one is like two and a half. It's all different. And mm -hmm. then if you join them together, that splint is going to find it's just going to keep breaking. Um, and patients will find it difficult to clean around the area. So there's not many indications for it. Um, 
also sometimes what it does it causes atrophy of the tooth and then the teeth die as well so it's, it's, it's not the best thing to do if you are going to do it when there's some indications where you will um, once you've treated the perio I would always use a like ortho wire and composite bonding rather than just slap bang and composite because that's that's yeah, also yeah, very yeah. brittle so you want some flexibility so it's also the what a wire is much better so um there, there are a few indications for it perfect so leave it to you basically if we're gonna if we're gonna do it. <laughs> send it across <laughs> and then i think the next sort of things really was that they both sort of go into as i say like what do what should gdps be looking at because i feel like i don't have that much knowledge of what you can do or what cool gr paradons can do you know so things like recession management and are you seeing more of it with the increase of gdp orthodontics is that a thing you know yeah. and maybe not even sort of management of recession but looking at it from a, a cosmetic point of view as you say like part of your armory of smile design and, and things like that yeah i mean so, so periodontists tr traditionally i like to think of it in three categories they will treat periodontitis um and they treat that non-surgically surgically they can do uh, resective surgery or regenerative surgery and then the other two mm -hmm. categories are, as you said um, management of recession and then crown lengthening and I think both of them is, they're basically the opposite of each other so with recession I'm definitely seeing more of it especially post Invisalign um, post ortho like you know even a little bit of recession can change your whole smile um, results so I think even patients are like oh can you do something about that even if it's like two millimeters so I'm seeing a lot more of that being referred um, for aesthetic cases, but also for like lower incisors. Often we do free yeah. gingival grafts. By the way, don't tell your patient it's called a free gingival graft. I had a patient the other day and he's like, oh, my dentist referred me to you for the free gingival graft. And I was like, yeah. And then, and then at the end, when I was explaining the treatment, he was like, I didn't know how to pay for it. I thought it was free. And I was like, oh my <laughs> God, <laughs> it was so funny. Was like, like a no. discount, there's a coupon. <laughs> oh my God, because it's called free. And I was like, oh my God, it's not free ginger graft. It's called it free. So just call it gum graft to your patient guys. Um, so otherwise they get confused. So that's what lowers and that's really common to thick, thicken the gum tissue, prevent the, the recession oh. from progressing. Um, so that I think it's really important, even if you're not doing the gum recession in your surgery yourself, to be aware of the types of cases to refer. Now, one thing to highlight here, it's not your traditional perio cases that will benefit. So what I mean by this is if your patient's lost bone, you can't, you can't do you know, gum grafts. You need the blood supply to actually, um, you, need a, you need a papilla, you need the blood supply, you need that type of a patient for these types of surgery uh, mm -hmm. procedures. So it's not your perio patients, it's your overzealous brusher, your thin phenotype, post-ortho, big teeth, narrow arch, that type of patient. Mm -hmm. um, so that's recession um, and crown lengthening is definitely becoming more popular. I mean, even I have patients come in saying, Dr. Rena, I want a gum lift. And I'm like, OK, let's do this. So gum lift is like the new word for it. Um, we call it the RW Peru uh, gum sculpting because it sounds a bit better because gum lift is a bit more than gum lift. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, that's becoming a huge part of your small uh, design cases. Um, even like, again, a couple of millimeters of a crown, you know, crown lengthening, like three to three or five to five can make a massive difference. So um, it, these things, honestly, when I was an undergrad, I had no idea about them. Um, I mean, I kind of knew they existed, but I didn't really know about them. And I think now I've done my specialist training, I'm like, gosh, this, I thought this is obvious. And I wasn't taught it very well. So um, I was to the university I went to was amazing. But I'm just saying as an undergraduate, you don't get that knowledge. So I think mm -hmm. it's really key for you to understand, even if you don't like perio and you're not going to take it any further, what can the periodontist do that's going to then help with the overall result from for my patients? So I think that that's the important point. Emmy's checked in as well. I uh, said so in terms of things like the like the crown length thing that you said, like a three to three, you know, gummy smile, that kind of yeah. stuff. As as the GDP, what kind of things should we be looking at? Uh, you know, to say that this is going to be a good case for it, or is there a way of knowing, um, you know, what kind of result you're going to be able to achieve? Yeah. How yeah. do you sort of test for it and stuff? Yeah, I mean, for gummy, gummy smile cases, um, normally, first you need to find out why they've got a gummy smile. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if you've heard of the condition called altered passive eruption. And um, that's uh, the condition which most of the reason why people have a gummy smile. Other things can be involved as well, like the, the, you know, what we call vertical maxillary excess on the shape of the jaw, short lip, upper lip, all that kind of stuff. But have a read up on altered passive eruption. It's a developmental condition where essentially the gum hasn't retracted to the right level. So normally when teeth come out in the arch, 
the tooth comes out, that's called active eruption. And then the gum retracts around the tooth, that's called passive eruption. When that doesn't happen, it's called altered passive eruption. And there's various different types. But anyway, the point is that the, the CEJ is still down here and the gum hasn't got to that level. So altered passive eruption, you'll find what you're really doing with that is you know, recreating what barge you should have done. You're taking the gum and the bone to where it should be. So normally after those cases, you, you just have the normal tooth on show. You don't have root because you're just taking the gum to the CEJ. Um, so have a look at sort of why my patient has um, a gummy smile. What is it? Because that will determine how you treat it. Like for mm -hmm. example, if it was completely jaw related, you'd have to do ortho to correct that. Then also assess the smile. Like, is it just one tooth? Is it normally like four, three to three, five to five? What can you visually see? How much of the gum is on show? Um, does it bother the patient? I mean, sometimes it might. Sometimes uh, some of the patients I get, they say I've seen like 10 dentists and everyone said I can't do anything about it. It's because sometimes they don't know that they can improve it. They just think it's the way I am. So you need to have the discussion with the patient as well. Um, and then, you know, do it well. What, that's what I say with, with crown lengthening is a lot of people, if they don't understand the principles, all they'll do is just cut away a bit of the gum. But you need to think about, okay, what about the biologic width, right? Have I got that three millimeters? Um, mm -hmm. If you don't, you need, to, you need to raise a flap and remove bone. I've seen so many cases that are then referred to me where they, someone, you know, dentist has basically invaded the biologic width. And it looks horrendous. I mean, it might look good for like a couple of weeks for Instagram, take your picture, put it online, right? And then I have to see them and they've got this red, like line, it's like you've got a felt tip and drawn along the gingival margin. Mm -hmm. And that's invasion of budget. Then you guess what? I have to do crown lengthening properly. Then you have to replace all those veneers. That's not the kind of dentistry you want to be doing. And sometimes it's fine to just remove the gum, but only when you have that biologic width. I should, by the way, call it supra gingival crestal. Supra, oh God, I forgot. Supra crestal gingival attachment. It's changed now in the new classroom. I've said I prefer <laughs> biology width. Yeah. Say, so. I think well, I think the, the the altered pass eruption. I think you dis, you discussed it with Jazz on on protrusive. Yes, exactly. Um, and then yeah, you brought out the super crest. Da, 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 da. Um, <laughs> and it's it's really interesting because that it's something that you like, I hadn't heard of it before that, but then when you explained it there, yeah, it's the it's the reason why we all know you don't do implants in someone until they're at least eighteen, but ideally twenty one because you know yeah. the gums are going to mature. But yeah, when you say it, that some people it doesn't happen. Why have we not heard of that? It's one yeah. of those weird things. It's actually a really common condition. It's like 11% in terms of incidence. So it's really common. Um, I think, by the way, crown lengthening, I mean, don't just think it's specialist treatment. As I was saying to Jazz, like, as a, if, I was, if I was working general practice, one of the first skills I would learn is to crown lengthen. Because if you can, whether it's restorative crown lengthening, aesthetic crown lengthening, if you've got that skill, honestly, um, that's, I run a, a one day course on, if you don't want to do the diploma, I do a one day course on crown lengthening. The next one's actually in a, in a couple of months in November um, at Londec in, in London. Um, but anyway, that skill, people go away mm. feeling confident to crown lengthen. I think it's, it's a great skill for you to, to invest mm. in actually. How much of your, well not day, but of your crown lengthening, how much is it restorative? How much is cosmetic? Uh, it's a mix of both basically. The principles are the same. So um, it's very hands-on. So I'll basically teach you the, the theory it's all step by step. Step one, theory, I'll show you on the pig's heads and model. We have gummy models, which are quite nice. Um, mm -hmm. And then you do it and then I check it one like one by one. Next step, da da da. So by the, I mean, for me, if I go on a course, I basically want to be able to apply it the next day. And that's what I make sure everyone's able to do. Um, and then a lot of the delegates will like WhatsApp me and be like, Rena, I've got this case coming up. Can you guide me through it? And, and I love doing that because I love seeing the, the outcome of it after. So yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's really good fun. So if you're keen, I think there's three more spaces for November. I think it's end of November. So have a look on perio.school um, if you're keen on that. So then in, so you said there the process then is, is can you just talk us through the process a little bit? And is it obviously yeah. different flaps and things like that for yeah. different accesses for different teeth, but you're raising yeah. a flap. Yeah, so with, with crown lengthening, the, the principles um, are, are the same for whichever type of crown lengthening you do. And it all starts off with firstly, um, resecting the gum to the level it should be. So you reset the gum, um, and you don't do it straight away, you do like what we call bleeding points, do a superficial incision, get it perfect, then reset the gum. Then you raise the flap, then you see, okay, where's my bone level? And where is that in, in uh, accordance to the reference point, which could possibly be the gingival margin, could be CEJ, could be your provisional restoration. Um, mm -hmm. And then you measure from whichever your reference point is, 
to the bo the alveolar bone crest, it's got to be three millimeters. Mm -hmm. And if you raise the flap, and technically probably wouldn't be three millimeters then, you then have to remove bone till you get three millimeters, basically. So you keep checking, is it three millimeters? Then that's it, you suture everything up um, and then let it heal. Two weeks later, you take the stitches out. Um, at this point, if you need to, you can put a provisional restoration on. Um, Again, uh, leave it for, for an, if it's a sort of restorative case in the back of the mouth, three months later, you put your definitive. If it's an aesthetic case, textbook answer is that you need to wait for six months. It's a long time. I say mm -hmm. most of the people who refer to me will then, like after three, four months, they'll put on their, their definitives. But textbook answer is six months in, you, then you put your definitives on. So that's the kind of process. Now, if you're doing uh, restorative crown lengthening, um, for normally, you're, you know, you're raising a flat buckley lingua, across the whole tooth, usually. Whether if it's aesthetic crown lengthening, you don't then need to like, resect palatally because that's it's an it's an aesthetic case, so you mm -hmm. only do buckle. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the other differences are things like restorative crown lengthening. Sometimes we use like a dressing, like Copac, to to stick on. It's like puncturing gum; it keeps the gums in place. I'm not going to do that front of the mouth. Um, and generally, in terms of consent for aesthetic cases, I generally consent for what I call revision surgeries because. If you just need to tweak it a little bit after a couple of months, then you, the patient you know, needs to be aware of that. So um, I consent for that, definitely for aesthetic. So, yeah, so the with, with those of, altered passive ones, yeah, the gum is higher than the three millimeters above? So, um, yeah, exactly. Well, so with the altered passive option, the gum is coronal to the CEJ. Yeah. Right? So you need to remove the gum to the CEJ. Then you raise the flap. And then it's the distance from your new margin to the bone. Yeah. Um, and so you need to recreate that basically with, with yeah. both removal. So you're, you're bringing it to where you want it and then checking almost that you've got your yeah. biological width for the fancy new name. <laughs> exactly. Then you need to, you know, Fine. remove the bone. Fine. And restorative, you're more about, it's more about getting your margin or... So restorative, like if you've got a broken down tooth, we all know you need like two millimeters of sound tooth tissue, right, before you restore. So you, you get that um, where you need it to be. And then from that point to the bone, it needs to be three millimeters. Perfect. And then is that, again, is that something you're doing more of now? Is it, the, uh, are these cosmetic things becoming more popular? Definitely the aesthetic cases. We, mm. we do like a couple of, like, it's really popular um and it's one of the things in peri i mean i love surgery surgery is not my favorite thing um and especially love crown lengthening and um, it's one of the things in peri where patients can see an instant change so they love it um and it's 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 really rewarding as well because i've had patients who come in and they're just so like their confidence is like zero they have you know they've been t a lot of them are teased because of their gummy smile um and then you do this thing for them and they just change as a person um and sometimes they'll then have restorative work after that and it's i mean you really make a difference to someone's life with it so it's, it's a really nice um, treatment to offer and then perio surgery yeah looping back to sort of general yeah. periodontitis management because this is a bit i was chatting with cool Jeet about it on monday i think it was yeah and what what are your sort of indications for doing perio surgery are there cases you do, cases you don't? Yeah, I have to say, like, probably 80% of my periodontitis cases will be treated non-surgically because mm -hmm. it just works beautifully. Um, but in the you know, very specific cases, like if you've got residual pockets of six, seven, eight millimeters that have, especially where the patient's oral hygiene is immaculate, sometimes you have these like vertical defects, um, they often need surgery. And we do resective surgery, which is basically, there's two ways of surgery treating pockets. You either cut them out, basically resective, um, or you regen. So if you've got these nice vertical defects, two, three more defects, we try and use things like Emdegain or BIOS and BioGuide, which is basically bone graft material to rebuild mm -hmm. what's been lost and suture back up. Works really well, to be honest. Mm. That was the exact sort of case we were talking. It was a patient I'd referred and it was isolated, it was like isolated, I think it was mesial of seven, yeah. vertical V-shaped defects, and it's just like surgery all day long. Yeah. And it, but again, it's something that, you know, he, and then I just didn't know that that's yeah. gonna be the perfect case for it. And he said the exact same thing. That's the thing, yeah. It's, it's, it's knowing, like even if you're not doing it yourself, it's knowing what is available and what can be done. Um, I wouldn't be, unless there's a real reason for it, I wouldn't like to maintain like a six millimeter pocket. It's, 
you know, you're 64 times more likely to lose a tooth with a six millimeter pocket compared to a, a healthy tooth. So it's, it's a high risk case. Um, so you've got to try and treat your pockets. Close We've got pocket. a good one now. How about horizontal bone loss on lower anterior area? I mean, normally, though, that's like a really, normally responds really well to non-surgical, like lower anteriors. I can't remember the last time I did surgery on lower anteriors. So I would say you want to tackle that non-surgically and it should work beautifully. Um, if not, of course, you can do surgery. I literally can't remember the last time I've done surgery on an anterior lower incisors. Mm -hmm. And so in things like the horizontal loss, it's obviously the, yeah. the number of walls of the defect that that's, in, that's yeah. the, you the issue, you right? Can't, um, you can't graft horizontal bone. You can't graft. You need, like, you need a container to put the bone into. So yeah. you can't graft on horizontal bone loss. It's not, it's, you'd have to do resective surgery. Um, whereas if Fine. You, so that's more you're just... Yeah, that you can't, you can't use things Almost like, crown length. <laughs> yeah, you sort of, yeah, you've just got yeah. to cut it away. Um, yeah. Whereas for, you know, ver you have to have a vertical defect to yeah. actually do bone graft of regen, regenerative. So, so that's the thing, you've got those two different sides, that resective, you've got that yeah. trying to do guide. Do you do like the same way sort of implantology is like, like GBR and things like yeah. that? It's yeah, similar principles. GBR, so it's um, exactly, we use membranes, we use bone graft, the same type of principle, exactly. Implant stuff? Is that anything that you're doing um, stuff as well? I actually decided to be a pure periodontist. So uh, I was, tra was trained to, to place implants. It's very different to perio, I have to say. It was mm -hmm. not something I uh, enjoyed very much. Um, I think it's great for, to get the skill. Um, I treat peri-implantitis, which is like a massive problem right now. Um, but at, uh, at RW Perio, we literally just do per you know, just... We just do actual perio treatment. <laughs> um, so but, with perio implants that you're saying that's such yeah. a big problem, what should us as GDPs, do we probe? What? <laughs> yeah, oh my God, you have to probe. Uh, please, <laughs> please probe because um, that's the only way you find out what's going on. Please don't be scared to probe. Take a radiograph. Um, they're so, so difficult to treat perio and it's not predictable. So you can't give your patient any like major hope about it, but refer... Um, you know, see tons of patients with it and we just try to, what you're doing really is you're slowing down the progression of it. You're never going to really fully treat it um, mm -hmm. and generally always need surgery. And an interesting question there with talking about sort of the crown lengthening, what's your take on deep margin elevation versus crown lengthening from a perio point of view? Yeah, I think perio point of view, I'd probably go for crown lengthening. Um, also depends on the patient, their oral hygiene um, and that type of thing as well. So it's, it's, it's specific to the patient. Mm -hmm. uh, just jumping back on the implants yeah special ultrasonic tips or is that nonsense um i would uh, personally like say the plastic ones are terrible um if you're going to use them in a perimplantitis case what we found is that the plastic just breaks up and it gets stuck in the pocket and it makes it worse Ooh. um so the thing is what people worry about is it scratching same thing with probing scratching the threads but the thing is if you've got peri-implantitis you're going to need to scratch that hell of a lot more to get rid of everything so i would personally just use normal normal ultrasonic mm -hmm. but that's you what my boss always says to, you only need to use ultrasonic as an indication like there's no but you know no um calculus it's healthy you don't need to use an ultrasonic there you can use you know prophylaxis you can use airflow that type of thing and just reinforce oral mm -hmm. hygiene so you don't it's not like you've got to go in there with the ultrasonic for no reason it's only if, if there's an indication but so airflow is you bring that into actual periodontitis treatment rather than just yeah. purely cosmetic side of it. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Airflow is 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 great. Um, I it's great for biofilm disruption. Um, I don't technically follow the their protocol, but I like it. I mean, I like it also for stain removal. It works beautifully, and patients love it. Um, mm. I like it because it gets rid of all the little granulation tissue that's stuck on the teeth, um, and it's great around implants, um, especially just for maintenance. Mm -hmm. Keep seeing bits and bobs of what's it called guided biofilm therapy. Basically, just disclosing and scaling, right? That's not a, anything. Yeah, different, is it? <laughs> it's, it's, it's a bit structured, a bit more structured. I think the lot of really like it. We've kind of adapted it to our own method. So um, yeah, it's an interesting one. It's just disclosing. But... We're doing what we're doing, what we're already doing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's why I think it's. Yeah. Um, if we've got any other questions, that's great. Please pop them in, um, and we'll try and get through them. But the last sort of question that I like to ask is: Is there anything that you do now or know now that you wish yeah. you started doing much earlier in your career, like a tip to young dentists and things like that? Yeah, um, I would say 
one thing is firstly invest in yourself um it's never a wasted investment i think nowadays you know to progress you have to invest in yourself um and you know doing courses doing appropriate courses is important i would say don't go crazy and do like 10 courses in one go pick things carefully like focus on one thing and get really good at it and then focus on the next thing otherwise it can be quite overwhelming you become like this course junkie doing 10 courses so um and i'm biased but i think peru is a really good one to start off with like to get your foundations and even if you're very experienced it will bring all your cases together whether it's you know just simple crown lengthening or whether it's just understanding perio and working with your hygienist and things like that so um i would say invest in yourself it, it's, it's a never a wasted investment and if people want to do perio courses you've got some good ones right so what have you yeah, got coming up <laughs> so, um well i would go on www.perio.school um and for the dentists out there there's a crown lengthening one coming up the day one um once mm -hmm. on a weekend um and also if you want to just learn from home we've got lots of online courses so there's the essentials of perio um for hygienists we've got the online course or we've got um the, the weekend course that's not running till next year though but and then if we really want to take it further do the diploma. I mean, it'll be great because it'll help you with complexity too. If you're a hygienist, it will really take you up to the next level, um, you know, you cut above the competition. So I think it's it's important. I think the thing at the end of the day, learning is fun and otherwise, and it's great you're doing things like these lives and so on. We've just got to learn together and progress together. Otherwise things get boring anyway. So um, it's worth keeping up the momentum um, and keep keeping in touch with colleagues as well. It's really important. But yeah, I think, if you want, I think everyone's missed that as well during COVID. Mr. Yeah, CGB. for sure, for yeah. sure. Um, if anyone has any questions about it, you can just drop me a DM on RW Perry or my, my personal account, which is Rina Wadia. And the, the diploma, do you have to have done anything else Perio before? Do you start no. off bare basic and... I will literally start from the very basic. So even if you haven't picked up a scalpel, um, we will teach you everything for a dentist. If you're a hygienist, literally, you don't need any, any experience. Um, so I should say as well, I would like to plug my... Uh, we've just, uh, we're going to be launching our Perio School Instagram soon as well. So if I'm going to be sharing some like educational content on that. So it's Perio underscore school. We haven't got any posts yet or any... But it'll be great if you follow along. There'll be some cool stuff on there as well. So we can keep you up to date. Perfect. We'll get you back on a live in six months on Perio underscore Amazing. school. <laughs> um, Smiles by Jodie's back again. She's just asked, a student uh, hygiene is able to do any of the online courses or do you have to wait till qualification? No. I think 100%, like, honestly, like, just do it now, because you'll be, you'll know everything you need to know, and then you're ready to go out and press. It'll also help you for your exams as well. So mm. um, I would advise, and we've had lots of students join, actually. So, yeah, anyone can do that. Emmy's ears have pricked up about periimplantitis. What, what are your thoughts on, he said, will you smoothen the exposed threads, Harry, and are you trying to stabilise without regeneration? Uh, it depends on the case, like, um, and the, the bony defect. Sometimes I do do regen, in most cases I do resective. Um, normally, sometimes I do smooth the threads, but it's a nightmare to do, so I just get the patient mm. really good at cleaning them themselves. So I have to say, permanent is not easy to treat. Um, so you just do the best we can, basically. And you're saying more and more of that, any particular, or just more people doing implants? I think it's more... <laughs> there, there, there are more of them out there. People, <laughs> it's just a dental tourism as well. Um, and some of them, you know, they're really, so they're not very good quality. And then you have to deal with it after because they can't go back to the country. And then we'll have a lot of problems actually because of COVID and travel and things like that. So um, it's, yes, it's a nightmare. People halfway through treatments and things yeah. like that as well. Not good for it. Perfect. I think we've answered everything. And yeah. Amy says, agreed, it's a mare. There we go. Um, thank you so much for coming on. You're very, was... Can I just say one more thing? Um, go for if, it. If, if you ever need a periodontist disguise, um, send we'll your patients to RW Perry. <laughs> Absolutely. We have patients from all over the UK. It's really easy to refer. You just need to go to www.rwperry.com forward slash referrals um, or drop me a DM and I can get um, Jasmine, our brandy, to send you a referral pack and so on. So it'd be great to see some of your patients. We see all, all types. If also you're interested in perio, I always get people coming along and observing um, with their patients and so on. So it make it make it quite fun. So, but yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's been great. And thanks for all the interaction, guys. Um, really enjoyed it. Yeah, awesome stuff, guys. If you've missed any bits or want to catch up, rewatch it, it's going to go, I'll post it on uh, Instagram TV now. Uh, and check in next week. We've got an Australian guest, so I'll be upside down, or he will, one of us will. Um, he's getting up at four in the morning, bless him. Oh. So uh, digital dentures, we'll see you there. Cheers, guys. Bye. Bye.